Hi, everybody. Um, we are covering pages 85 to 121 today um, for our asynchronous class. And um, I wanted to uh, once again project uh, the three volumes of um, Evelina uh, that are featured here um, and the photograph that I took at the Newberry Library. We can see volumes one, two, and three all beautifully stacked on top of one another. Um, today we're almost finishing the first volume. Um, um, so you might even just read till the end of volume one if you're feeling ambitious. It's not that much longer. But I did want to cover some of the main, um, I don't know, some some passages that stand out to me and that I think extend our classroom conversation from Monday. Um, so, um, so I'm going to share some passages with you um, here that cover our reading for today. Um, so we we continue to see Evelina's. Um, venture venturing into public spaces um, and um, one of the one of the public spaces that she goes to in today's reading is the opera house um, and unfortunately for Evelina um, she is obligated to go there with um, the Brantons uh, who we met in our reading for Monday but who we will continue to see at various uh, points throughout the novel. So if you go to page 86, um, the Brantons are depicted as um, as lowborn and as vulgar. Now, Bernie is is a little bit classist, right? I mean, this is this is also part of the um, social world that Evelina participates in. Um, but the Brantons, if we go to page 86, um, here Evelina is, is um, conversing with uh, Miss Brantons. And um, on the middle of page 186, Evelina writes to Mr. Villers, I was extremely disconcerted at this forward and ignorant behavior, right? Because the Brantons want to go with her to the opera house, but they're not dressed appropriately. Um, and yet their rudeness very much lessened my concern at refusing them. Indeed, their dress was such as would have rendered their scheme of accompanying our party impracticable, even if I had desired it. And this, as they did not themselves find out, I was obliged, in terms the least mortifying I could think of, to tell them. They were very much chagrined and asked where I should sit. In the pit, answered I, in the pit, repeated Miss Branton. Well, really, I must own I should never have supposed that my gown was not good enough for the pit. So even though Evelina, um, in many ways, doesn't understand the social codes of, of London, as we talked about last class, she still has a she's, she's a fast learner. Right. And she's adapting. Um, and she knows that the way that her that the way that the Brantons are dressed will, will just not bode well. They, they will just stick out like a sore thumb and, and they're not appropriately dressed for being in this particular part of the opera house. If we go to page 90, um, uh, you know, eventually Madame Duval decides that they're all going to go anyway. And since Evelina is, Miss, is Madame Duval's uh, uh, granddaughter, she's really compelled to go with them. And, and she's cringing the entire time, right? Um, we talked a little bit about cringe on Monday. Um, this is more cringe for Evelina. Um, so this is middle of page 190. We were then all crowded into the same carriage to go to the opera. Uh, but when we arrived at the opera house, I contrived to pay the coachman. They made a great many speeches, but Mr. Branton's reflection had determined me not to be indebted to him. If I had not been too much chagrined to laugh, I should have been extremely diverted at their ignorance of whatever belongs to an opera. In the first place, they could not tell at what door we ought to enter, and we wandered about for some time without knowing which way to turn. They did not choose to apply to me, though I was the only person of the party who had ever before been at an opera, because they were unwilling to suppose that their country cousin, 
as they were pleased to call me, should be better acquainted with any London public place than themselves. Um, and so Evelina is, is really just in a tough spot here because she's going to the opera house. Men are watching her. We know that Sir Clement Willoughby is all over her. Um, we know that there's Lord Orville, who seems to have taken a shining to her. There's Lovell, the fop, right? These men are all watching her. And she is ashamed of the connections that she has with the Brantons um, because of her indeterminate social status, right? And because the Brantons are depicted as being low-born. Now, because of this vulnerability, right, because of her indeterminate social status and because the people who are supposed to be watching over her don't do a very good job of it, she's vulnerable, right, in, in this public space. So Sir Clement Will Willoughby, who is the libertine or rake, um, has taken a shine to Evelina and, and creates havoc for her and actually terrorizes her um, there at, at the opera house. So we go to page 99, we can see this um, in, in our reading. Um, so at the end of the opera, when it's time for Evelina to, to go home, she's now in this place where the Brantons are with her and she's trying to avoid them. Meanwhile, Sir Clement Willoughby kind of preys on her and orders a coach to take her home by himself, which of course would be um, a very, it would not look good. The optics of that for Evelina would be um, terrible. So on the, on the bottom of um, page 99, after Clement Willoughby is making these advances to her, she says, I now begin to apprehend that he had himself ordered the man to go a wrong way. So she's in the coach with Sir Clement Willoughby and he's ordered um, the driver to take the wrong direction. And I was so much alarmed at the idea that the very instant it occurred to me, I let down the glass and made a sudden effort to jump to open the chariot door myself with a view of jumping into the street. But he caught hold of me, exclaiming, for heaven's sake, what is the matter? Um, and then a few paragraphs down. So she's actually trying to, like, jump out of a moving coach because she's so terrified at being in this space with, um, with Willoughby. A few paragraphs down, never in my whole life have I been so terrified. I broke forcibly from him and putting my head out of the window called aloud to the man to stop. Where we then were I know not, but I saw not a human being or I should have called for help. So she's terrified. She's in this terrible situation. Um, she's being subject to sexual harassment and potentially sexual um, violence. And But she, she finally makes it home. Um, but over on page 102, uh, the, 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 the terror that she's experienced that night prevents her from actually getting any sleep. Um, top of 102, or second paragraph down, the, the adventures of the evening so much disconcerted me that I could not sleep all night. I am under the most cool, cruel apprehensions, lest Lord Orville should suppose my being on the gallery stairs with Sir Clement was a concerted scheme, and even that our continuing so long together in his chariot was with my approbation, since I did not say a word on the subject. So she's mortified by the Brantons, but at the same time, she's worried that Lord Orville is going to misapprehend the, her being with Sir Clement Willoughby. So she's in this, like, she's in a series of impossible situations, right? It's like one scene after another, it's her just being vulnerable and being in, a, in difficult circumstances. Now, part of that involves, of course, Madame Duval, who has brought the Brantons into her life and wants to take her back to France. But we know that Madame Duval is, is not a suitable um, guardian for her, even though she is her grandmother. Um, and Evelina expresses her um, anxiety to, um, 
to Mr. Villers in a letter on page 105. Um, she writes to him, the assurance of your support and protection in regard to Madame Duval, though what I never doubted, excites my utmost gratitude. How indeed cherished under your roof the happy object of your constant indulgence, how could I have borne to become the slave of her tyrannical humors? Pardon me that I speak so hardly of her, but whenever the idea of passing my days with her occurs to me, the comparison which naturally follows takes from me all that forbearance, which I believe I owe her. Um, and then she can, so yeah, so Madame Duval is, is a victim to her feelings, right? She always is acting on whatever impulse she feels in the moment. And because she's uneducated, um, she's, she's unable to make the right decisions. And you can see the tyrannical humors. Um, those are the kind of the, the, the un, unjust rule that she exerts over Evelina is something that is not only mortifying, mortifying to Evelina in public spaces, but it, it's tyrannical. It's, it's oppressive. Um, so she's going to continue to be this problem for Evelina as we continue. Then, of course, um, her, Madame Duval's, um, mortal enemy, uh, Captain Mervyn, right? Who is responsible for dousing her in the mud, um, earlier on in our reading for Monday. But we also see Captain Mervyn's, um, misogyny on page 110. Um, and in this scene, they're, uh, the, the, the men are together and they're all talking about, uh, about women. Um, and this is the middle of 110. Uh, we both and with eagerness declared that we had received as much, if not more pleasure at the opera than anywhere. That is, um, Evelina is speaking for herself and for Miss Mervyn. Uh, but we had better have been silent, for the captain, quite displeased, said, What signifies asking them girls? Do you think they know their own minds yet? Ask them after anything that's called diversion, and you're sure they'll say it's vastly true. They are a set of parrots and speak by rote, for they all say the same things. But ask them how they like make, making puddings and pies, and I'll warrant you'll pose them. Um, so... This is really terrible, right? Like Captain Mervyn is, we know he's unrefined. We know he's the country bumpkin, the unrefined um, country squire. But here, as in many other parts of the novel, he reveals his blatant misogyny. Um, and of course, Evelina is also under his protection. So where does she turn in all of this, right? Her vulnerability is expressed in uh, page after page. And why all of these endless speeches of men? Um, that's one question, you know, like there's so much space given to um, the male characters in this novel. You might find yourself wondering why and why doesn't um, Bernie take back more space uh, for women's dialogue? Um, but in, in answer to that, and I, I do have this passage from Mr. Villers um, that I want to share with you, but in response to this previous question about why all of these endless speeches of men, I want us to think of once again about the formal elements of this novel, right? This is an epistolary novel. So this is all Evelina's framing. So even though these men are talking endlessly and, and nauseatingly, <laughs> quite frankly, it's Evelina's um, social critique. It's her framing of these men's words that that serve as the feminist commentary and rejoinder to the misogyny of Captain Mervyn, to the sexual violence of Sir Clement Willoughby, to the absurd foppery of of Lovell, and um, and so and so even though men take up a lot of the dialogic space, it is Evelina's voice, and it's ultimately Bernie's voice. That, that frames um, these dialogues and that identify them as absurd. Um, and that's part of Bernie's satire. And one last mess, one thing I want to share to you is we have the very end here on page 117. Uh, Mr. Villers, 
you know, it's, again, Evelina is writing letter after letter. It's like letter in continuation. Evelina is writing to the moment. She's expressing her vulnerability to Mr. Villers, um, expressing her consternation. And then Mr. Villers finally responds on 117 and says, um, alas, my child, the artlessness of your nature and the simplicity of your education alike unfit you for the thorny paths of the great and busy world, that is London. The supposed obscurity of your birth and situation makes you liable to a thousand disagreeable adventures. Not only my views, but my hopes for your future life have ever centered in the country. Shall I own to you that, however I may differ from Captain Mervyn in other respects, yet my opinion of the town, its manners, inhabitants, and diversions is much upon a level um, with his own. So Mr. Villers has profound anxiety about, the, about London as a, as, a, as a space for Evelina. He sees it being a disagreeable situation for her. Um, he also gives her feedback on Lord Orville. He finds Lord Orville up higher up on page 117 to be a man of sense and of feeling. Um, and he also goes on to say, doubtless he thought there was much reason to tremble for your safety while exposed to the power of Sir Clement. He does not like Sir Clement Willoughby. So, um, again, even though it, it, it is... It is Mr. Villers speaking here in this letter, in this epistolary response. Evelina's words are really what frame this entire narrative. So, um, uh, for our, um, sorry, that previous slide, you can disregard it. Um, for the class chat, and this is um, all I'll ask you to do for class today to get um, uh, credit for attendance, um, I'd like you to write about how Evelina strikes you as a character. Um, I'd like you to quote and cite a passage that illuminates your point. And it can be any aspect of her character that at this point you find compelling, interesting, contradictory, um, whatever it is that, that, that you um, are sort of struck by in her up to this point in the reading. And again, be sure to quote um, a passage and um, that will be available for you in the class chat, so go access that in D2L. And make sure that you continue your reading as scheduled um, for next week. Um, again, Monday we don't have class, but um, Wednesday I'll be back, and we will get caught up on all of the reading. Uh, I hope you all are doing well, and take care. Um, you, again, you have till midnight um, Wednesday to submit your class chat um, question. Okay, bye.